sorry, I always have to do this. I just I feel like I'm sacrificing something here. Moving the song sheets. If you're here for the first time, or if you're joining us online or listening online, we're in a series in the book of Hebrews. Um, so you can turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. Uh, the last few weeks is Bob Whitaker. Bob, yeah, Bob's been up here, and he kind of in, in, in typical Bob fashion, <laughs> yeah, we're going through the book of Hebrews, and wow, <laughs> you know, it's kind of this, this like, what is going on in this book in a good way? But if, if, you, if you tackle it, if you get into the text, there are some, some things that, that are, are, get a bit curly. And we're going to cover uh, 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 some curly things this morning, so, so bear with me. Give me much grace. I've interacted, I, I counted about, about 12 different reference volumes on, uh, on this book, on this, on this passage that I have today, and um, there's not consensus, like there's a, one, there's a couple of verses that, like, they're all saying something completely different. And so I probably will too. So, um, um, yeah. A fun fact, oil paintings, some oil paintings don't fully cure for 60 to 100 years. So if, if, if you've purchased one of these things <laughs> and you put it up on your wall and you smell this, this lovely, lovely smell... Uh, <laughs> And you don't have to wonder why Bob Ross was always so happy. <laughs> um, and so in the spirit of Bob Ross, and as I turn our attention to the text today, um, I hope to have no mistakes from, from what I share with you, just happy accidents. <laughs> so, in Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, Hayden uh, opened up the text very well. Um, but I want to highlight uh, one, one fact about Jesus talking about Jesus. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature of, of the of Heavenly Father, of Yahweh, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So Jesus is kind of the glue that keeps the universe together. After making purification of sins, so Jesus came to save his people from, his sin, from our sins, uh, to make purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become much superior to angels, as the name he was inherited is more excellent than theirs. So Jesus is superior to angels. He's, he's better than angels in a superlative way. In Hebrews 2, 14 through 18, chapter, and verse 14, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, to destroy our adversary, Satan. That is the devil. And deliver all those who fear and death were subject to lifelong slavery. So you have this idea that God has come to set the captives free. He has come to set us free from slavery. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 paints a great picture of this. And wrapping up this, this theme uh, of the gospel and what Jesus came to do. He delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. And so we all were born into the domain of darkness and apart from the saving work of Jesus, being purified by him, by his blood, and, and also to have our sins propitiated by him, we have no business of living in God's kingdom. And that's hugely important for our passage today. It is only through the blood of Jesus that we have access to the living God. Verse 17 Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers, Jesus, in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. This kind of begins this language of Jesus being a high priest. And next week, 414, I think, is one of the most significant verses in the book of Hebrews. So who has, 14, who has 414 now? <laughs> You're right there. So 414, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about that. Um, no pressure. So that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So that's, that's encouragement for us. An encouragement to this community um, that we're calling Hebrews. So the description of Christ as the faithful high priest kind of segues really nicely into Hebrews 3, 1 through 6. Therefore, holy brothers, you have shared in a heavenly calling. Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Interesting language there. Jesus being called an apostle, the one, a, a sent one, one who is sent. 
In John 20, 21, Jesus says, just as the Father has sent me into the world to his disciples, so I am sending you into the world. So Jesus is, is one who has sent, and the apostles are sent with a message, with a job to do. So Jesus is the apostle sent by the Father and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all of God's house. So this idea of faithfulness in God's house. There's some words that, that kind of show up here. And it's always good if, if, if you're into studying the Bible and you're spending time with firsthand interaction with the scriptures, there's a, a website called stepbible.org. And you can download the app and it's really good. But on the website, you can highlight, just highlight and hover over a word and it lights up all of those words in that passage. So if, if, you, if you hover over faithful whoom, here in 3, 1 through 6, you start to see, ah, it's talking about faithfulness here in, in a repetitive way. And also the word house is also talked about in a repetitive way. So talking about Jesus and Moses. And although Jesus and Moses alike were both faithful, they differed in their worthiness to receive glory. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all of God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, prophecy. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast to our confidence and boasting our hope. So in Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses speaks of Jesus. God will raise up from among your brothers a prophet like me. You must listen to him. Hold that thought. You must listen to him. Ian, thanks for that, that wonderful commercial about listening to God. Today is time to listen to God. You must listen to this prophet that God has raised up from among the brethren. God is the implied agent of the passage word has been counted worthy. So who is counting Jesus worthy of more glory? For he is one who has crowned Jesus with glory and honor in 2.9. The Lord honored Moses above other Old Testament prophets, but he has honored the son above Moses, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. As our preacher is about to show explicitly here in these next couple of verses. Our author exploits the fact that both the Hebrew word bait and the Greek oikos, use of house, both refer to a habitable structure and also people who inhabit it. Those two things are going on here. And we're referred to as the household of God. So we're not a physical structure other than the fact that we now have, through faith, the living God who now dwells within us. And that that delineation here, and this is hugely important as well, this community is called holy brothers. So who makes us holy other than God himself? So Christ's superiority to Moses leads to a conclusion that is both comforting and challenging. It is comforting to learn that now we are his Christ's house. He dwells in us uh, through the spirit and the sense of being his family, the brothers and sisters for whose liberation he assumed our human nature. Jesus became a man so that he could redeem for himself a people. And his rulership secures the safety of those in his house. The challenge arises from the contingency here in verse 6. So we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. If. We hold fast to our confidence and boasting in our hope. So this language of God building a house is, is, is uh, very similar to what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. So you who are far off and you who are near have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's talking about Jews whose, whose history was the promises of God and the Gentiles who were far off in God and had no access. And, and now God, through Jesus Christ, is building himself one new man. He's... he's taken away the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile, and now, through his Spirit, is, is, is building a dwelling place for God, which is us, his people. 
I'm going to let that tension stand. There's a big if there. And there's another big if coming up in verse 14. As our next section will show, people can belong to a community that experiences God's act of power and mercy and yet fail to respond in a persevering faith. It is only by focusing attention on Jesus, our faithful apostle and high priest, that we can sustain such lifelong, hopeful, and I would say tenacity of following God throughout our whole life. Now, this... This can kind of get confusing, but this little table kind of helps, I think, uh, sort out the use here. So Jesus is faithful to the one who appointed him. Verse 2, Moses was faithful in his, God's house, as a servant. Christ was faithful over his, God's house, as a son. And verse 6, and we are his house in which the Spirit dwells through faith. All right. I could have given a whole sermon on those six verses, but for the sake of time, I had to kind of hit the gas pedal. Now, Hebrews 3, 7 through 11. And if you notice in your Bible, if you have your Bibles open or on your app, this is set apart as poetry. You can always kind of tell poetry if you're reading the Psalms, some parts of, uh, in the narrative, uh, historical narratives, there's, they're set apart, like in Genesis, where you see it's set apart as poetry. So this is set apart as poetry. And so you, if, you, if you're familiar with, with the Psalms, you'll, you'll see, ah, this is, this is from Psalms 95. And it says very clearly, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness. Wait, now, this is weird. So we're talking about Jesus being an apostle and high priest. And, you know, his faithfulness, Moses' faithfulness as a servant in God's house, as over God's house. And then it's talking about our community of persevering in our faith. Now, whoop, let's go to Psalms 95 and hear this warning. That's kind of out of the blue. And it's, and it's, it's, it's a severe warning. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they, have, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So God is, is making an oath here. And it's, it's to the extent that, that I will be destroyed by my own wrath if they get in. Whoa. Which is interesting thought and one that I've been chewing on, but I digress. Now, whenever you see a warning in the scripture and, and, a, and a, an imperative and a command to, to listen, it's good to stop and listen. It's always good for us as God's people to, to hear the word of the Lord. But what's happening here in Hebrews 3 and chapter 4 is this. If there, if there was just one stop sign. So if you're going through a neighborhood and you come to a, a four-way stop, there's a stop sign. You stop, you look, and you go, right? Now on the highway, if you're going down the highway and you see a sign, high crash risk area, Flashing lights, be prepared to stop. Hey, hey, be prepared to stop again. And oh, by the way, make sure you know that there's a stop sign coming. And then you get to the stop sign. That's our passage today. So, I thought it would be good. We're being told to listen. To stop and say, Lord, help me hear you. So I thought we could do that right now. This so Lord, what will you have for me today from this, this, this stop sign? Let's take a moment and just, just ask God, right? So, all of the stop signs, high crash risk area, Psalms 95, seven, the second half of verse 7 through verse 11. 
is quoted seven times in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. Some commentators have said that Hebrews 3 and 4 is commentary on Psalms 95. Verses 3 through 7 in its entirety, we'll get back to that, but take note in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice. It refers to Psalm 95, quote, in the present tense for the Hebrews community, but also for us today. As the Holy Spirit says. Now, often in the scriptures uh, throughout the Bible, you'll, you'll hear, it is written, thus says the Lord. But this is unique, in, and it's a device that's used throughout the book of Hebrews. So listen to this as we continue to go through the book. As the Holy Spirit says. So we can easily dismiss Psalms 95 as like, oh, well, I love the Psalms. Don't you love the Psalms? And, you know, you know and, and you hear about, sometimes, and you hear about Israel, I don't know about you, but if you read through the Old Testament, sometimes, some of the stories about Israel is like, man, you guys didn't get it. How could you, how could you be so dumb? And then sometimes it's, it's almost like the Spirit goes, <clears throat> Brian, <laughs> you can do that too. How can I be so dumb? And so, so let's, let's, let's not dismiss this warning. It's like, yeah, well, of course, the Israelites did that. But, you know, I'm not going to do that. Chapter 3, 13, but exhort one another every day is long called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 3, 15, as it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. 4, 3, for we who have believed enter that rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. 4, 5, and again, this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. And two times in 4, 7. Again, he appoints a certain today, today, saying through David so long afterward, and the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So this is the warning, to listen, to hear the Lord's voice, and to not harden your hearts as they did. And I thought, as you quote a chunk of scripture, you're not just imp- importing that chunk. You're importing the context. So I thought it would be good for us to look at Psalms 95, uh, the first part of Psalm 95. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. You know, we were shouting to the Lord, uh, in, you know, and we're, we're clapping. That's, that's kind of a, uh, an outward response to an inward reality in our hearts. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountain are also his. The sea is his, for he made it. He is the creator. And his hands formed the dry land. So, in verses 1 through 2, this is called for joyful worship, singing, shouting, music, words. It's, it's expressive. In verses 3 through 5, why do we worship? Because God is such a great God. He is our creator. He's the one who made us. He formed us in our mother's wombs. Worship belongs to God only. We cannot worship God until we have a proper sense of who he is. John Stott says, not until we grasp who the Lord is are we inwardly moved to worship him. And the truth of who our God is and that he provides salvation for his people, the rock of our salvation, the rock of my salvation, should cause our hearts to soar. Over the years I've been working, I've worked in youth ministry, I've worked in university ministry, And I've met a lot of young men and women. And I've met a lot of young men and women who've grown up in church and and come on the campus and, uh, you know, having conversations with them. It's like, well, yeah, I grew up going to church, but I've kind of moved off of that and I've kind of moved on. And in having conversations with them, there are a couple things that they have in common. And remember, as God's people, we're called to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and all of our strength. 
How can we do that if we don't know much about God? So that's one thing that I find in common with, with a lot of these young men who have kind of like left the living God. They don't know much about him. And the other thing that they have in common is they don't know much about what we call the good news. The greatest message in the history of mankind, that the living God came down, took on flesh to pay the penalty for our sins so that we could have life, that we could be redeemed, that we could be restored, that we could have our sins purified. They don't know much about the gospel. And so amazing grace I remember one student telling me, I, I, don't, I don't find anything amazing about God's love. I think he just has to love me. And his life reflected that. Well, he's kind of doing me a favor, I guess, but uh, I'm going to live how I want to live. Verses 6 and 7. Why worship? Because he is our dear shepherd. I mean, you go right to Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. If I have the Lord as my shepherd, I have everything. Where do I need to go apart from him? And so, uh, you know, I have everything. Uh, and, and you hear the echoes in John 10 where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. So Jesus is our shepherd. We are the sheep of his pasture. We owe God worship because he created us, because he is God. Even more, we worship him for what he has given us, his life. He has called us to put our faith and trust in him. James Montgomery Boyce says this. Psalms 95 tells us how to worship. Indeed, it does more. It is a call to worship. It explains how and why we should worship. And it warns of what can happen if we do not worship but harden our hearts instead. Now, there's a fun thing that's happening between Psalms 95 and the book of Hebrews. In chapters 1 and chapters 2... You see all of these superlatives about Yahweh, the rock of our salvation, the great God, the great king, the creator, our maker. Those titles are assigned to who in chapters 1 and 2? Jesus. Okay. So maybe we have a Psalms 95 thing going on here in Hebrews. 1 and 2 has set up this reality that Jesus is the living God and, and he's the one who's came to save us. Our hearts should be soaring. He's our apostle. He's our faithful high priest. And we are part of his community. Now, be careful that you don't depart from him. Be careful that you don't depart from him. Now, the second half. This is Psalms 95. And you're going to notice there's a few things that are changed between the text and uh, here and then also the text in, in Hebrews 3. But what's happening is that the, the, the author of Hebrews is quoting from the Septuagint. And sometimes you'll see, uh, if you have a reference in your Bible or in a commentary, LXX. That's the 70, the the. The, the group of translators that, that translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. So they're quoting the Greek Old Testament, not the Hebrew Old Testament. That's all I'll say about that. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah on the day at Massa in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and, and, and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. What was the work that they had seen? They had been delivered from the hand of Pharaoh. Through signs and wonders. They were sitting on the beach with Pharaoh's army taking a bead on them with nowhere to go. That death was certain. And what happens? Moses cranks his staff down and the sea parts. And they walk through as on dry land. And once they get through on dry land, what happens? Pharaoh's like, well, that looks good. I'm going to come for you. And then the sea folds in and drowns Pharaoh. And his army. Wow, that was awesome. How long does that last? You read Exodus 15, the song of Moses, and everybody's like, whoa, yeah. And then by 17, what's happening by 17? They're already starting to, 
to crawl away, to leave the living God. Like, what are you doing? But we do that in subtle ways all of the time. Hebrews 3 through 7. Today, if you hear his voice, as the Holy Spirit says, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. So that, that's a little change there. So we have this negative example of Israel's wilderness generation supports the obligation of those who are in God's house to hold fast to our confidence in Christ. Psalms 95 draws together in, in, in verses 3, 8, and 9, draws together two incidents from Israel's post-Red Sea travels in the wilderness in order to illustrate that generation's hard hearts, expressed in open rebellion. The Hebrew text of Psalm 95 contains the meaningful place names Meribah, which is strife, and Massa, testing, assigned to a wilderness location where, where thirsty Israelites put the Lord to the test, demanding proof of his presence among them. So the LXX, the Septuagint, followed by Arthur, renders these place names in Greek terms of rebellion and testing, which form a bridge to the later incident at Kadesh Barnea, Numbers 14. So go read Numbers 14, Numbers 20, which we don't have time to do today. There the Israelites balked at entering the promised land. Remember, they sent in the spies, and there was faithful Caleb and faithful Joshua. And all the other spies says, there's Nephilim there. There's giants. If we go into the land, we're going to get mowed down. And I think that posture, if they went in on their own strength, they were absolutely right. They would have no business defeating all of these people in the promised land. But what did God say? I am going to go before you. I will fight for you. And they said, we can't do it. And Joshua and Caleb was like, they're kind of like David with the five stones. It's like, I'm ready. Let's go. And so the people said no, and it got so bad that they wanted to stone Moses. Okay, you probably shouldn't do that. Um, so they balk at entering the promised land. Joshua and Caleb summons not to rebel, but to trust the Lord. Testing the Lord and rebelling against him characterized this generation. So don't be like them. Hebrews 3, 12 through 15. Now, that was talking about them. And now it's shifting to us. And 16 to 19 is going to go back to them as, as by way of reminder. So this is, this is talking to us. Take care, brothers. And it's that, that, that be attentive. Take special attention. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away, to leave the living God. But exhort one another every day as, as long as it's called today is that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed, there's that if again, if indeed we hold to our original confidence firm to the end. Now, Poll, I could put up a, an online poll, but how, how many of you would like to leave here today with a sinful, unbelieving heart that wants to leave the living God? Anybody? Well, no, 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 Paul, I, I tricked you, Paul. No one, I don't think any of you would, would consciously say, I am aiming to have a sinful, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So what's the opposite of that? A believing heart that moves toward the living God, that runs to him. And so how do we take care to not have that sinful, unbelieving heart? Well, God has placed us in a community of brothers and sisters, a holy brethren. Why? So we have eyeballs on our lives. What is one of the first things that goes when people depart from the living God? Have you seen so-and-so around for a while? No, I haven't seen him around. I wonder how he's doing. I wonder how she's doing. One of the first escape hatches from, from following the living God is to depart from community. And there's another one that's coming up in, in, in chapter 4. So to stay in community 
uh, to, and to be part of a community is Hebrews 10, which we'll get to, that says, let us consider how many we be spur one another on to love and good deeds. So we want to encourage one another, not just don't do that sin, but also let's love people really well. Positive encouragement and then also warning encouragements. That's what we get in community. How am I exhorting? How am I encouraging others to do that? Am I receiving exhortation? Am I receiving encouragement from others? Do I seek it out? Do we do that well? That, that is the charge from this passage. We're, we're to do this. And here's the curly part. And we are his house if we indeed hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Wow. That might seem innocuous. Um, but this phrase, we have come to share in Christ, could literally be rendered, we have become Christ's partners. Or we're joined with him. We in Christ have, have one father and belong to one family. Think Ephesians 4. And so through Christ's incarnation, his obedience, his sacrifice, and resurrection, we share the blessedness and benefits that are rightfully his. So we, Paul's injunction, we are in Christ. We have everything that Christ has. We have the same relationship with the Father. Such privilege must not tempt us to be complacent. However, for, for the only faith that unites to Christ's grace is a faith that endures to the end. Just as the hearers identifies the son's house as conditioned on holding fast to their confident hope, in verse 6, so their status as his co-heirs and partners depends on keeping the end of their grip on the substantial reality they had grasped at the beginning of their Christian pilgrimage, at the beginning of their journey. And this is what the author of Hebrews is encouraging this community to do. Hold fast to this confession. Hold fast to this confidence. Don't let go. And, and there's other if passages throughout, throughout the, the New Testament. Paul, in, in, uh, in Colossians 1, he reminds, God's, reminds us, he reminds God's people, you who were once alienated in hostile mind doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Amen. If indeed you continue in faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, you have heard. Don't let go. Keep pursuing him. John, and 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So this is, these ifs kind of can can be twisted to say lots of things. So if, if you don't keep uh, attending, if you don't keep tithing, if you don't keep keeping the Sabbath, then, well, I, got, I don't know. Are you, are you in? So we can, we can take the things that we've been commanded to do to be the, the, the measuring line for, for if we're in the kingdom or not. This book, uh, Four Views on the Warning Passages of Hebrews, it's a great book. This guy, Buist, I have no idea, Buist M. Fanning, he says, careful attention to the wording from 3 6 and verse 14. Careful attention to the wording shows that these lines do not cite what would be true if they hold on, but what is already true of them, if in fact they do. Holding on to their confidence will reveal the reality that they already have come to share in Christ, not what they will share. By continuing in faith, they demonstrate the work of Christ has already begun and will certainly accomplish in them. This is the summary of 14 pages that he spends on these two verses. <laughs> okay, you've, you've got this faith. You will persevere. You will continue. J.I. Packer says, the only proof of past conversion is present convertedness. That made sense to me. Continue to walk in all his ways. And we stumble, we fall. But 
continue to get back up and continue to, to be forgiven by him and continue to pr- pursue him. 316 through 19, there's a fun give and take here. For those who have heard and yet rebelled, was it not all those who left Egypt and Moses? There's this question and answer. Who were the ones who rebelled? It was those, those, those folks. 17, and with whom was he provoked for 40 years? That's the question. And the answer, was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And verse 18, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? And the answer, so we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And unbelief is our biggest problem. Jude weighs in on what was happening with that generation. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved people out of the land of Egypt, what? So Jude is telling us that Jesus saved people out of the land of Egypt and afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So this is this high warning. And I hope I'm making some sense here that we have this confidence in our faith And why would we leave the living God who has authored this faith? And why would we not persevere to the end? Why would we not continue as God's people, as his his sheep, the faithful shepherd, who gives us everything that we need? Chapter 4, and we'll move through this quickly. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. The similar language that Paul uses in, in, in Philippians 2 to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not looking over your shoulder, do I still have it, but continuing to pursue the living God and continue to abide in him. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. If, if you just would have united yourselves to Caleb and Joshua... You, you would have entered in. God would have handed the enemies over to you. He would have fought for you. For we have believed into that rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. And this talks about, in Hebrews 4, 4 through 7, talks about how God rests from his works and invites us into a Sabbath rest. And then also 4, 8 through 10, where it talks about this, this future rest. Joshua takes the people into the land. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. It's not a temporal rest that he's talking about. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. How are we able to rest? To know that Christ completed the work on our behalf for those who place their faith and trust in him. In Hebrews 4, 11 through 13, again, this idea of striving to enter the rest so that none may fall short of that same sort of disobedience. And a very familiar word um, in 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is the second point of departure, community and also God's word. A lot of times when when you're going through a, a rough spell and maybe being drawn to fall away, to leave the living God, where does your Bible go? I don't know. That goes on the shelf. I think it does that because, as, as 4.12 says, the Bible is reading you. The Bible is discerning the thoughts and intentions of your heart. And, and, it, and it's loud. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this away for a while. So this becomes more tenable. This departure from the living God. So don't leave community and don't leave the word behind. Let it have its way with you. The mention of division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow is intended not to draw physio- physiological or anatom- and not, uh, anatomical I'm sorry, distinctions, but to dramatize the skill by which God uses his word to penetrate our apparently impenetrable hearts. God sees our hidden inner life. 
And he encourages us to remain. Whew. So, the history of the Israelite rebels at Kadesh should move us to sober fear. They refused to believe the good news that they heard, and their bodies fell in the wilderness. We must avoid at all costs their example of doubt and disobedience. God's rest, which remains open to those who believe the good news, now delivered by God's last best spokesman, Jesus Christ. We strive in anticipation of the rest that awaits us at the climax of our earthly pilgrimage. We're not home yet. There is a heavenly rest that, that awaits us. For it is faith in Christ's work, not ours, that places us in a lifelong process of pursuing that rest both now and in the life to come. Let's pray. Well, Father, I pray that you would incline our hearts to live in joyful worship of you. That, um, that our outward activities would reflect the inward reality that you are our God, that you are our Savior, and that you have redeemed us. I pray that uh, you would build in us a community that encourages and exhorts one another to continue in the, in, in the race, to continue the walk, to not fall away. Um, and also to, to, to encourage one another to, to help us love people well, those in our community and those not yet in our community who don't know you. And I pray, Lord, that you, by your grace, would help us to walk in all your ways, both today and all the rest of the days that we have in our life. And I pray that we would be able to do that for your glory. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.